Gentlemen, uh, we talked about the sling. You all have your sling set up correctly now so that you'll be able to acquire a great sitting position uh, with the sling. Uh, what I'd like to point out is that these slings that we're using have numbers on them. Uh, for myself, I uh, normally go in position number six for sitting, number five for prone 300 rapid, and I go as far down as number four for 600 slow fire. It's an individual preference, so just keep track of what holes you are using uh, from position to position. And that'll change as you get more experience using the sling. The sling will be your best friend in all of the positions except for standing. Uh, in standing or offhand, you're required to have a parade sling. That is, that is your sling is going to be tight and is going to... Um, uh, you'll have a tighter sling. Some folks like it a little looser. I leave mine just a little bit loose. But what the requirement is, is that when you're in the standing position, the sling is closest to your body. You can't have the sling out here or, you know, just, just kind of dangling free. So you do have to have the sling closest to your body. Uh, some folks, like I said, like a real tight parade sling. Uh, however, um, I don't use it, but some folks do. They feel that it gives them a little extra pressure uh, over on the, on the forward hand. Uh, and so it's an individual preference, but the sling does have to be closest to your body in the standing position. Uh, okay, so that's the sling. Uh, next thing I'd like to talk about is the different pieces of gear that we use um, with high power service rifle. and. Uh, here we have the mat. There are various mats out there. Uh, this particular mat is a champion's choice uh, cotton duck with rubber. Uh, it's set up for me being left-handed. You can get them left-handed, right-handed, or ambidextrous. Uh, you're going to use the mat for the prone position. Uh, one of the tricks that I've learned about the mat from uh, Master Sergeant Retired Dick Curry is that it works best when you naturally place the mat pointing at your target. The, uh, for example, if we're going into the rapid fire prone, it's a lot easier if you line up with your target and then facilitate your mat so it's pointed right at your target. Uh, that'll help eliminate the possibility of you falling in on the mat and not naturally be pointing at your target. So that's just a little tip. Um, when you come to the position and you're gonna set up your position, uh, you wanna go ahead and get that mat pointed right at your target. Because out here, there's 150 targets and it's very easy to be off by 10 targets, one way or the other, if you don't get yourself set up properly. Okay, any questions on the mat for prone? Let's talk about sit. For sitting, some folks don't use a mat, some use a mat, some fold it once, some fold it twice. I like to fold it like this because I like that little extra cushion under my brain housing group. So we, uh, you can have just a little bit because there isn't going to be a position that is uh, perfect. You're going to be shooting at ranges where you're sitting uphill, you're sitting downhill. The object is to find the most level piece of terrain that you can. And then by folding the mat up, you can get yourself just a little extra cushion so that you're uh, pointed properly at the, at the target again. Okay, some of the other gear that we use. The sweatshirt. The sweatshirt accomplishes a couple of different things. Uh, one is that it identifies who you're with. Uh, the second thing that the sweatshirt does, besides absorb perspiration, is it provides you with filler so that your coat fits your body better. Uh, in addition to that, you'll find folks wearing the sweatshirt in lieu of the blouse. It's okay when you're down range, uh, and it does help on cool days as well. But basically, the object of the sweatshirt is to provide covering for your arm in case a hot case comes down your sleeve, it doesn't burn your skin and it helps your coat fit better. So, questions on the sweatshirt? Okay. The next piece of gear that we have 
is the coat. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the coat and actually put it on. Um, I won't put it on for the sweat with the sweatshirt for now uh, because of the sound system, but I will put it on. And if you don't have a sweatshirt, your blouse will work fine as well. Now, I'm left-handed, so putting the coat on. This particular coat is leather. It has a zipper here. Some folks like firmness in the offhand, or they like the flexibility. You can change that with the zipper, as well as it'll give you a little ventilation. There are side zippers for when you're in the sitting position to give you ventilation there. There's a pocket for our ammo pouch. We'll get into that in a little bit. And of course, we have the buckles up and down the coat. What I'd like to do is demonstrate the proper way to put the coat on. Now keep in mind, a lot of this stuff is just common sense, but there's a little reason that goes behind all of it. When you're building your position, you want to find the most level piece of ground you can. The coat gives us the most support in the standing position. Just like when we put on a coat to go out, we always zipper from the bottom up or button from the bottom up. Shooting coat is no different. You want to go ahead and start putting your coat together from the bottom up. Now what I found works for me is I'll cross my legs. And starting at the bottom, I'll put the strap in and I'll pull it snug. Come to the next buckle, same procedure. And the reason my legs are crossed is it's easier to put your coat on. Because the object of this coat is to provide you with stability. So you start at the bottom, snug it up, and work your way up. Now when you get to the midsection, since we're all different shapes and sizes, you don't want to snug that to where you can't breathe. So you may have to leave that out a little bit in order to breathe. Getting up near the top, snug her up. When you're done, raise your arms up because you want to be able to get that rifle up there and then you want your coat to sit where it's going to sit when you shoot. For me, having the coat like this allows me to put the butt of the rifle in the place where I normally go and then settle into position where I'm naturally looking through the sights. The coat is providing stability for me for the midsection, for the back, and around the shoulders. Questions on the jacket or the coat? I like the zipper open, so it provides me with a little bit of flexibility when I'm in the standing position. Again, the coat provides you with support. Whether you're in a standing or in the other positions, it provides a little padding. Now, I do have a little bit of room in here. That's where the sweatshirt would fill in. Okay, so to properly get the coat to fit right, sleeves need to be the right length, and of course, you know, unless your wife puts it in the dryer or you put it in the dryer, it should fit okay. Right. Last year this coat was, I think, I think she put it in the dryer. This year it seems to fit. Okay, coming out of position, reverse the process, and you're out of the coat. Now, in the other positions, sitting and prone, you'll normally just attach the top two to give you room here. When you're in the sitting, you're going to unzip if you have zippers. When I'm in the prone, I'm going to unzip the left side so I could get into the prone position. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the actual positions. What are your questions on the coat? Okay, the scope. The scope we need for many reasons. The most important reason we need the scope is so we could see where the shots had hit um, and what the value is when we're down range. Now I'm a left-handed shooter. So my setup is like this. Most folks put the scope on the other side, i.e. if you're a, a, a right-handed shooter, the scope would be on your left side. And I'll demonstrate that. If you're a right-handed shooter, 
it would set up similar to this and then just lean back and take a look through the scope. That's how most people do it. I have developed this strange way of doing it because I'm left-handed and the scope has a 45 degree angle on it so I naturally set mine up the opposite so that I could shoot and look through the scope on the same side. But in order to build my position, I have to build it so that I'm not hitting the scope with the rifle. Okay. The other reason you need the scope is so that you can see what the value is when you're in the scoring mode, i.e., or coaching. If I'm scoring, I'm going to set the scope up. So all I have to do, I could watch my shooter, and I could look through the scope, keep track of what's going on. Questions on the scope? Okay. One more thing you can do with the scope is you can read the wind. On a hot day, you look through your scope, and you'll see those little wavy lines that come out in front of the target. It's called mirage. By taking the scope out of focus slightly, it makes those lines show up just a little more. And you want to look at the lines just in front of the number boards. And if the lines are going straight up, that tells us there's no wind. But if you start seeing those little wavy lines go up and bend to the right, you can be sure that there's wind coming out of your left to the right. And vice versa if it's going the other way. Now, the velocity of the wind will become clearer when those lines start to bend more to the left or to the right. The faster, the stronger the wind speed, more of those lines are going to bend one way or the other. Use that as a guide to help you decide how much wind to put on. Also, there's flags that are located out there. Looking at those flags and looking at your scorebook will tell you how to calculate how many clicks to put on. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but that's where your scope will help you see how the wind is doing by looking at the mirage. Questions on the scope? Okay. Other gear that we have. We have a cart. This is something that you might not have now, but you'll have later on. Carts come in various different configurations. This particular cart allows me to have all of my gear as well as a cooler to keep some, something in there to keep us cool. Um, within my cart, I have a towel. A towel is extremely important on a day like today. Removing perspiration from you and your equipment. The scorebook. The scorebook or data book will help you keep track of everything that you're doing, whether it's 200 yards slow fire, 200 yards rapid sit, 300 yards rapid fire, or 600 yards slow fire. The object of the data book is so that you can write down what kind of conditions exist, what your zeros are for elevation and windage, as well as to make little notes. Shot number six, you know, it may have come up a nine. Why did it come up a nine instead of a 10 or an X? You can write a little note in there. Well, I, put, I jerked on the trigger or whatever it is, or put down something positive. We always want to reinforce the positive. So let's say you had a 10 or an X. What I normally do for the sake of time is I just take the large target here and after I break the shot, I'll make a little mark in the little target to show what my call was. That's where I think the shot is. And then when the shot actually comes up, I'll write a number in the large area to designate where that shot actually hit. And between your call and where the shot landed lies what really went on. So you have to keep that in mind. And be honest with yourself in these books because this is what's going to help you the most is keeping track of the data that occurred when you were firing a particular match. Now as I mentioned in the scorebook or the data book, some of them have wind charts. I don't know if this particular one does. It does. Okay. It has a wind chart. And basically, this is, for instance, this is a 200 yard wind chart. And what it shows me is that it's for 77 grain ammo 
and quarter minute sights, which is what I believe all you have on there. Now let's say that the wind is coming out of the right and it's six, six, um, 10 miles an hour. It tells me that I have to put on six clicks. So six clicks at 200 yards is a minute and a half. So remember quarter minute clicks, four of those to the minute, it calls for six, minute and a half. By using this chart, it's pretty sure that if you look at your wind and you have an honest wind call for speed and you have an honest direction, this is on the clock or the compass, uh, and you use the number of clicks in the book, your shot should be pretty close to right on. Questions about the scorebook or the wind chart? And there's wind charts for 200, 300, and 600 yards. There may be one that goes out to 1,000. But the data book is, is great. Different data books are out there. Uh, I have a clipboard. This comes in handy for when you're scoring people. Uh, also with the clipboard, I have additional wind charts. We have the glove for the non-shooting hand, the non-firing hand. The glove provides you with the padding and the stability once they're broke in so that you're not wrestling with the rifle. The object of a good position is to have the rifle naturally pointed at the target and this arm, the non-firing arm, is placed against the body and basically is a fence post for you to rest the rifle on. Once that position is established and you have the glove on and the sling goes across there, it takes away from cutting off the circulation in your hand. Plus on a cold day, this is really invaluable. Regardless, the non-firing hand shooting glove provides you with stability. It, it gets broken in so it provides natural support and it keeps your, your veins from getting crushed by the sling. Questions on the non-firing hand glove? Some folks on the firing hand, because they have small hands or little bony hands like I do, prefer to have a shooting glove or a golf glove or a baseball glove, regardless. The kind without the fingers works best, or you could take a regular glove and cut off the, the trigger finger without your finger in it. And that'll provide you with a better grip on the uh, pistol grip and allow your trigger finger to still work the trigger. It's different for different folks. Uh, as your hand gets sweaty, it may slip around a little bit. This helps with that. My hand doesn't slide very much and I have a good grip on the pistol grip. Questions on the firing hand shooting glove? Okay. I have a 20 round magazine pouch that I keep four magazines in. These are all 20 round magazines. And um, I have some of them with red tape on it or any kind of tape, so I have the number on. When we shoot sir, uh, rapid fire strings, you shoot them two and eight. You always load the two first, fire your first two, and switch to the eight. I write them on there so that there's no confusion. The more things that you can do to eliminate confusion when you're in position will help you gain some advantage and consistency. So when I load them up, two and one, eight and the other, they're all in the pouch. You're never gonna shoot more than, than four magazines at a time. So if you have one of these pouches, you could preload all your magazines and not have to worry about it when you get on the line. Always load your magazines ahead of time because when you get to the line, three minutes goes by real quick. Questions on the magazines you need for rapid fire strings. Now when you shoot the match tomorrow, the next three days, you'll never use more than two magazines at a time. You're gonna have your preparation period where you're not firing anything and then you'll have your actually firing period where you need to have your two and eight ready. I have an ammo pouch for standing. In it, I can put 20 rounds and I can put two ciders in the front. While we're here, you'll load just 10 rounds maximum for standing. You won't shoot any more than 10 rounds in one string for standing. Questions on the ammo pouch that fits on the coat? This, this, you definitely need, this makes life a lot easier. Okay, uh, what else do we carry? Um, I have a magazine, I'll pass this around, that has a, uh, does not lock to the rear. The, it'll lock to the rear, but the, key, the, the, the keeper allows the round just to lay on it. It doesn't 
try to turn it in one direction or the other. And that magazine I use for the preparation period. I, I use it for standing where you have to load each where you have to load each round one at a time. I use it for standing. And I also use it in my um, uh, slow fire strings where you're shooting 20 shots one at a time. It allows the round to lay on top and it doesn't uh, capture the round underneath there. Uh, what this does is it eliminates the possibility that you're going to have a, a jam or anything else. So I highly recommend this little this little keeper or this little slider, and we can order those through uh, one of the vendors out there. These little guys. Um, some folks don't like to have side light coming in. You can cut a piece of cardboard or plastic and put it on and eliminate the side light from coming in on one side or the other. Also, I have another piece of cardboard that I slip under there so that when I'm in position, I'm not looking through the non-firing eye and I could leave both eyes open. By leaving both eyes open, you're not going to cause any kind of uh, offset in your pupils. Pupils actually rely on each other. So when you're doing this, this pupil is actually seeing a little bit of stress. By leaving both eyes open naturally, there's no stress on any on your eyes. Questions on the blinders? You could cut them out of cardboard. You could get them. Some of the vendors are giving them away. Uh, they're great to have. They come in real handy. Do we have to use uh, eye protection on here? Eye protection is always a good idea. Uh, Sergeant Buell, do they require eye protection out on the line? Did you know of? In the pit, I know they do. We'll look that up. I'll, I'll get you details on it. I, I wear eye protection all the time. So. You should. I don't get the rule that says because otherwise. All you need is one little piece of something to come out of that chamber. Well, when they're fogging, I have something for that. Okay, this, this here is, um, well, let's talk about it since we're talking eyeglasses. Um, let's go back to eyeglasses for a second. That towel that I mentioned before also comes in handy. For wiping off your glasses, I always keep a spare set of glasses. There's different configurations of glasses. There's different colored lenses, whether you want to gather light, take away light. Uh, can't go wrong if you're wearing some sort of eye protection. Now, what does happen with eye protection? When it rains, it gets wet. When it gets hot and steamy, you can't see anything. Anti-fog spray. I purchased some of this a while back, and I found basically what it is is it has soap in it. And by in introducing soap onto your lens, you uh, create a barrier so the fog is, doesn't, doesn't come on there as much. Uh, it helps fight off the fog. So I just put a little of that on there and clean it off with the towel. And it's always good to have clear, clear lenses so you're not looking through a spider web. Uh, and that helps eliminate the fog. The other thing that will help eliminate fog is to keep hot moist air from rising out of your jacket into your glasses so keep that in mind uh, questions on glasses eye protection uh, looking at the front sight as you get older it's going to get tougher no two ways about it so what do we do for the front sight well we have this spray that you can spray on the front sight and make it very dark or we have a carbide lamp. In the carbide lamp, using carbide, it makes a real big, thick black smoke. And we put that on the front sight just a little bit. You don't want to build up on there. And it darkens it enough so that you could see the relationship between the front sight and your target. Very important to be able to see the front sight. Now, if you don't have any of that stuff, you could burn a plastic spoon, and the black smoke that comes off of that will work well for your front sight. Um, a little bit of oil. When you start running enough rounds through here, if you don't get it clean right away, it's always a good idea to have a little oil to keep all the machine parts moving. Whenever you have any kind of binding, it's going to show up in your groups. They're going to open up on you. Um, 
and of course a variety of pens. Sweatbands come in various configurations. Uh, this one's a small sponge. It seems to work pretty good, but I went over to Walmart and picked up some of the other sweatbands. They absorb sweat well as well. But sweatband, you're definitely going to need that out here. If you don't have a sweatband, you're going to have sweat running in your eyes. Okay, what are your questions on the equipment so far, Sir Manning? Timer. The timer is another invaluable tool. When they tell you you have th three minutes for preparation, now this one squeaks. I'm going to have to get in there and eliminate that because they don't like to hear the alarms on the line. So it is good to have a timer so you can see what's going on. Now tonight I'll open this one up hopefully and I can get to that. But they don't want to hear the alarm going off. I, I don't know if they'll penalize you for it these days or not, but uh, that does get distracting. And the other thing is, while you're out on the line, you don't want to distract the people on your left or right. So try and remain quiet and do your business, not a lot of talking, and concentrate on what you need to do to produce a good 10-shot string, whether it's slow fire or rapid fire. But a timer will help, help you stay... Um, focused on what's actually going on. You, the last thing you want to have happen is you run out of time and you don't even know that you're getting close. How you doing? Good. I'll get right with you. Okay. Uh, questions on the equipment. Uh, earplugs. Earplugs and hearing protection. You only have one set of ears and eardrums. Uh, they come the, the squishy kind, which I like. I prefer these. And then there's the headphones. I used to wear the headphones all the time, but then I started hitting them on the rifle, so I don't wear these as much, but I do wear the, the squishy earplugs. And if you have real loud folks around you with loud, high-power rifles, put your earplugs in and use the headphones too. But remember, you need, still need to hear the commands from the line. And that's about all of the equipment that we have. Um, and all of it, again, is individual preference. Some folks can walk out with two magazines and a rifle and be just fine. Other folks rely on these other bits of equipment in order to give them um, the, uh, a little bit of a, an advantage. But uh, again, it's the most important thing to remember shooting any kind of weapon is natural point of aim, sight alignment, sight picture, and break the shot without disturbing any of that. That'll go a lot further than all of this stuff put together. Uh, the trick is to be consistent, uh, be focused, and break the shot without making the change in the alignment or the sight picture.